Welcome, Ocean, to season two of the Water Underground Talks. It's a real pleasure to have you here. Kia ora, Tom. It's lovely to be here. Yeah. Ocean Mercier is uh, from Taiharenga Waka University or Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand. Maori scholar um, is moving into the world of groundwater and bringing some insights along uh, with her. Um, so I have a couple questions for you, Ocean, to, to start off with. I know you've done lots of different kind of research topics. Uh, I was wondering, uh, going back into your uh, life, how did you first develop a passion for water? Oh gosh, that's a difficult one, isn't it? Um, uh, water, you know, when it's part of your life, you mm -hmm. sort of don't recognize it and don't see it in your life until um, until you 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 maybe have a difficulty with it. Mm. Uh, maybe a, a, a near drowning incident, which I have had as a young person, okay. or um, is a, a kind of a, a storm situation or or inclement weather. And so um, it's sort of uh, part of um, my tradition as a Māori person, I think, is actually seeing uh, the characters behind the, um, mm. the waters so that, um, you know, if it's really wet and really stormy, we might recognise that that is um, actually a deep expression of sadness of mm. um, the father sky uh, mm. towards Mother Earth, um, whom he separated from. Um, now, these were not necessarily things that I um, I was thinking at a particular age because I wasn't particularly grow, grow, uh, raised in a, in a strong kind of Māori cultural background. Uh, but uh, so I'm not sure that I can pinpoint a, a sort of a research interest in water, except mm -hmm. to, to, to say that it's been a lifelong journey of recognising um, different ways of looking at water. And... Um, and different ways of characterizing um, the, the the water elements around us, uh, and that continues to be a lifelong journey. Mm, that's beautiful, yeah. And that uh, leads me to a, another question. That, uh, is kind of a weird question in a way, based on what you just said. But I'm wondering if there's kind of one academic article, or maybe it's not academic at all, and another form of knowledge altogether. Um, around water that has um, impacted you the most and, and, and what kind of form that takes and how that, in, how, how that shows up in your life? Yeah, sure. Um, when we, uh, I think uh, one of the first um, academic papers that I thought of when we first had this discussion uh, offline uh, was the, um, actually in your part of the world, Deborah, Deborah McGregor's amazing mm -hmm. 2021 mm -hmm. article mm -hmm. uh, where she talks about the kind of nuts and berries approach to Indigenous knowledges mm -hmm. and um, argues for, I guess, a stronger recognition of Indigenous knowledges as their own mm -hmm. um, knowledge system and, um, and it's potentially another frontier for colonisation if we're not careful in our approach mm -hmm. to indigenous knowledges so that was sort of top of mind when we you first asked, asked that question um, but then you invited me to think about well are there any non-academic articles mm -hmm. and um, uh, I do um, I, 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 I like I, there's, a, there's poetry that I think of there's mm. art that I think of and mm. Mm -hmm. In Māori tradition, we've got these amazing uh, traditions of artwork, whether it's mm -hmm. carvings or paintings or, mm -hmm. or sculpture, uh, as well as amazing literature in the form of poetry that's been handed down orally or more uh, recent written forms of poetry. So um, mm -hmm. there are uh, just amazingly inspiring examples there. But I, I actually often uh, think of my, my queer, my grandmother, and she loved to just go to the sea and collect mm. sea snails. Mm. Uh, and that was just something that I knew that she loved to do and was a way that I kind of, you know, I connected to her. Mm. And although I'm not a big fan of sea snails to eat, <laughs> I connect to them through her mm. and there's a connection to the ocean through her. So if a person can kind of be a model or mm. an example of a relationship with uh, water, um, I'll nominate my grandmother. <laughs> cool, <laughs> cool. Mm, thank you for sharing this. That's lovely. 
you're you're kind of I already see te te uh, uh, tease teasing hints of this, but I'm wondering if you can expand a little bit and describe how your personality or maybe your personal interests strengthen you as um, as an academic and 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 as a kind of a practitioner and kind of bridging um, these worlds or yeah. Yeah, thanks for the question, Tom. Um, so my academic background is in maths and physics. Mm -hmm. Went through did the Bachelor of Science, Honours, PhD in physics. Uh, and so I've been very interested in knowing about science and understanding the methods of science. Uh, but one of the things that um, was a little bit of a frustration when I came out of that long journey, um, in spite of being offered um, teaching posts and uh, work as uh, research associates, uh, all of which I took up, but I, I was never able to connect that science with the needs of communities. Mm -hmm. And so it sort of took me um, coming away from uh, the physics department into mm -hmm. the Māori studies department to learn mm -hmm. my heritage language, Te Reo Māori, uh, mm -hmm. and to learn about the history and philosophy of science and mm -hmm the history to some extent of Māori ways of doing science and Māori knowledge to, um, to kind of bring those, those threads together or mm -hmm. to have some language and some, some guidance around doing that for my, my career. So um, yeah, you rightly say it, is, it has been a, quite a bridging effort to bring mm -hmm. those, those things together and to, to try and reconcile them because mm -hmm. looking back on that experience, I realised that the, the system that graduated me as a Māori PhD scholar in physics was not ready to, um, to match mm -hmm. me up with the needs of the community. And mm -hmm. we're still actually struggling to bring those, um, you know, the opportunities of science and the, the wonderful techniques of science under the, the guise and direct guidance and direction of communities that, that mm -hmm. really are crying out for these techniques. So, mm -hmm. um, and I'm not there yet. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's a long journey for all of us, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, it's wonderful to, yeah, to remember as we're all learning <laughs> always, right? Yeah. Thank you. Um, my, I think maybe my last question is just more, uh, kind of bringing back to the, sort of some of the themes of this whole season two around groundwater, anti-racism, decolonization and sustainable development and how you see these connecting with groundwater in your work or in, or in your kind of region and, and in your work in New Zealand maybe. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I think one of the, the key themes that I'm interested in in my work right now is this idea of um, epistemic equity. And if I just mm -hmm. unpack those terms, because it's mm -hmm. quite um, academic, uh, epistemic as in the epistemologies or people's knowledges uh, and what's considered valid knowledge and um, seeking equity uh, within research uh, systems, within science and innovation systems for indigenous knowledges to, um, to play a part. There's a lot mm -hmm. of, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's an international call for indigenous peoples in a sense to guide the world um, mm -hmm. into a, a, a more ethically and morally guided future um, mm -hmm. that enables us to tackle climate change by looking inwards, looking at ourselves and ourselves mm. as humans and our behaviors and realigning and, and, and resetting uh, some of the ways that we relate to our environments that have had real detrimental effects on them. Uh, and so, but uh, it, it won't work if, if, uh, if it's just a sort of a one way um, mm. pull across from, Indigenous wisdoms into, you know, a system that, you know, arguably has um, facilitated us to be in this really difficult position where we're dealing with wicked environmental problems, climate change, and the like. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I guess that would be my answer to that question. Is that's my kind of key focus in all of the work that I do, including this groundwater project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I said that was going to be my last question, but can we squeeze <laughs> in one more? <laughs> Go for it, go for it. <laughs> um, I, I, it's a more general question about if there's any kind of one nugget, or maybe you just did share it, um, that you want to share with the next generation of groundwater scientists and practitioners. 
Yeah. Um, and you said it at the beginning today that I'm, I'm a bit of a newbie in the groundwater science area. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I've got this background in physics, but um, that was in condensed matter physics. I was interested in superconductors and um, mm. conducting polymers. Um, so, so I'd sort of hesitate to be giving advice or tips or hints, um, except that um, I think we all need to uh, open ourselves up a little bit to mm -hmm. the idea of what science is, mm -hmm. what science can be, uh, because there are, um, I, get, I think, amazing insights and there's amazing guidance within Indigenous knowledges. Uh, and um, so I guess my invitation would be just be open, have a look, um, listen, uh, look a bit further, uh, reach out to somebody if you want to know more. Uh, but that there are also lots of ways to kind of support and be an ally to Indigenous peoples in, um, in the fight for epistemic equity or just social equity and... Um, and, you know, just uh, in, in giving people back um, access to their, their waterways. And, mm -hmm. yeah, so I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in the presentation, I think. Um, Wonderful. Well, that's a great segue. Thank you very much, Ocean. <laughs> I, I look forward to, yeah, your presentation. Oh, kia ora koutou. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, it's a privilege to talk to this particular topic about how Indigenous knowledge and science together can help us to understand the underground and the water systems uh, that flow from underground to above. Uh, I'm the head of school of Te Kawa Māori, the School of Māori Studies at Te Hirikawaka Victoria University of Wellington. Um, and my name is Ocean Mercia. And I'll be talking about a project that's led by uh, geological and nuclear sciences in this project, hence the, uh, the extra logo there. So I'd also like to acknowledge that I live and work on the lands of the, um, the people known as Te Atiawa and Taranaki Whanui. And I'm not a member of that tribe myself. My um, iwi, my tribe, is up the east coast of the North Island. Ko hikurangi te maunga, ko waiapu te awa, ko ngāti te iwi. So in that I um, acknowledged my mountain is Mount Hikurangi, shrouded by cloud in this image here. Uh, my river uh, that emerges from the catchment of Hikurangi is Waiapu, that's uh, what you see in the foreground and the, the distance there, the Waiapu River. And my people is the Ngāti Puro people who, um, who are on that, in that East Coast region. And we have a, uh, a saying, uh, or certainly this was captured recently in a report that the Ngāti Puro Freshwater Group wrote uh, a few years ago now, and headed one of the chapter titles uh, with these words here, Te Waiu, Te Wai Māori Mō Ngāti Puro. Uh, so their interest in freshwater um, acknowledged that Te Wai Māori, which means freshwater, uh, so way is water there and Māori is um, sort of normalised or, or fresh and um, emerges from uh, the underground. So te wai u there, wai u, uh, is uh, a word that denotes that the waters come up from Mother Earth. So that, that are, those are wai u are the waters of Papatuanuku or, or Mother Earth. So there's an explicit recognition there of the importance of underground uh, freshwater systems for our tribe and many other iwi or tribes have um, their own aphorisms, their own um, proverbs in relation to water and the importance of uh, healthy, robust uh, underground aquifer systems. Another famous Ngāti Puro person uh, who continues to be an inspiration for me and could have been one of my answers to one of your questions before, Tom, is Sir Apirana Ngata. Uh, he's uh, uh, a, a very well-known um, academic and uh, statesman. He spent uh, a long time in politics and served in parliament, uh, fighting for... Uh, economic and social rights for not just Ngāti Puro people, but for all Māori in New Zealand. And this wonderful saying of his uh, encourages us to take hold of 
of um, all that we need really, uh, the tools of uh, the Western world, if you like, the Pākehā is, um, is the New Zealand term for uh, New Zealand European peoples, uh, as well as um, keeping hold of the treasures of our ancestors, keeping hold of our, our identity. And in the work that I do, I, um, I'm also exploring the, the tools of our people, the Māori, which includes our knowledges. And I think there's an increasing recognition that um, our knowledges, our mā tauranga, uh, are, um, are really important uh, in charting a, a healthy, well uh, uh, future uh, where humans and environment sit in, um, in better relationship with each other, let's say. So with a few more words on this idea of mā tauranga Māori, which is, I guess, our version of an indigenous knowledge system uh, doesn't just mean knowledge, it means wisdom, it can mean education, uh, the methods by which knowledge is created, ways of knowing, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm going to abbreviate it MM uh, throughout the slides in this presentation. You could say it was a, a research and development, it's a tested form of knowledge uh, that has been collated, tested and transmitted orally over you know, hundreds of years, up to a thousand years. Uh, and it's specific to tribes, uh, thus is specific to places. It's a values-based knowledge system and it's relational in that um, uh, the oral transmission of it from person to person is a really important part of Mātauranga Māori as a knowledge system. So it's not just a data set. It's not like an archive of information only, although it, it has that, but as a tool for thinking, organizing information, uh, considering the ethics and the rightness of knowledge uh, and informing us about how we ought to be in our world. This is uh, the words of Hiriri Mokomid, who's actually the founding professor of the uh, uh, school that I um, head up at uh, Te Hiringawaka Victoria University, Wellington. The other thing about Mātauranga Māori is it's more recently been uh, considered and accepted as a taonga or treasure under the um, articles of the Treaty of Waitangi, which means that the Crown um, is co-signatory to the Treaty of Waitangi, has a duty to protect uh, Mātauranga Māori or Māori knowledges. And uh, in response to that duty to protect, uh, we have a policy in Aotearoa in New Zealand called Vision Mā Tauranga, which is pretty key now and increasingly influential in our research, science and innovation system and sector, uh, which is, as you can see there, about innovation potential of Māori knowledge, resources and people. And uh, some of the themes include, this is just a screen grab uh, that tells a little more about the policy uh, not too um, interested in you getting all the details, but it is about um, improving health and social well-being, achieving environmental sustainability through uh, tribal relationships with um, lands and sea, and exploring Indigenous knowledge, science, and innovation. So the project that I've been involved with for um, three years now, uh, led by geological and nuclear sciences and funded by the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment that, um, whose website I was showing you just before, is called Te Whakaheke o Te Wai. And this means the pathways and flows of the waters. It's led by a, um, a hydrological modeler called uh, uh, Dr. Catherine Moore. Uh, and the project um, supports water management based on new research understandings of flow sources, pathways and lags through uh, local, regional and national scale of systems. Uh, we're developing new methods and um, producing new data to, um, to help to support these um, clearer pictures basically of what's happening underground. And um, if I just look at the project goals, um, Yep, so as I said, we're developing new uh, national, regional, local scale models to better understand our underground systems. We uh, have a particular focus on the Heretonga Plains uh, and an interest in other uh, catchments, but uh, the, uh, that's, we, we're, we're looking at, at particular regions for this, this um, 
for the um, for the purposes of this project to help us understand um, other uh, catchments. Uh, so we're doing new measurements of river conductivity and groundwater age um, measures using um, all the usual suspects, but also quite um, um, novel, I think, uh, tritium isotope techniques, which uh, are particularly useful in Aotearoa, New Zealand, because of the, um, uh, the clear signatures that, uh, that we get here. We're incorporating data into models. That may sound like a no-brainer, but um, that hasn't been done very strongly in the past. And very importantly, we've got iwi or tribal input into the priority setting of uh, the sorts of problem areas that we, um, we are directing our efforts to. So the models and the data plus models are, um, we hope anyway, this is our aim, are responsive to community concerns. And uh, one of the, um, the key things about this project is that we do have um, iwi input through our um, Ngāti Kahunganu uh, partners in the Heretonga Plains, which is on the east coast of the, the North Island. So the other contribution to this project that's really significant and quite new on the scene is the um, focus on Mātauranga Māori and oral histories that tell us that um, deepen our understanding of uh, these aquifer systems uh, and, and uh, give us local uh, Māori um, views on them, um, as well as oral histories that chart out specific uh, changes in the ways that waters have flowed over the, the hundreds of years of occupation uh, that Māori have, um, have had in these regions. So that deepens the time scale of data that we can uh, we, we have available to us. It, it gives us a broader context to consider, you know, the um, the different tribes that have have moved in and out of regions and the ways that um, tribes moved around regions, often using waterways um, that uh, post settlement European settlement were drained, for instance, for to be converted to farmland and um, in agriculture um, and horticulture. Uh, the other thing that we're exploring about the um, connection between and the braiding, if you like, of Mātauranga Māori and science is how the oral history observations can constrain and potentially make more precise the numerical modelling. And as our project leader puts it, we're endeavouring to give a numerical voice to community concerns. So to kind of bring the force of that, that evidence to our concerns over um, how fresh is the fresh water, um, how much fresh water is there to, to use in the first place. Uh, we have huge problems in this country uh, with over extraction from agriculture and um, in this particular region, uh, there's lots of uh, growing from orchards and particularly vineyards as well. And we're also <laughs> keen to, um, to get a, a better sense of how pathogens flow through the underground and the models are helping us to do that. So the key person who's leading the program on Mātauranga in the Te Whakaheke o Te Wai project is Dr Amber Aranu and she's from Ngāti Kahunganu. She in fact grew up very close to um, the, the kind of core place that we're interested in in this project which is Bridge Pa and they, in particular, Paritua Stream runs through Bridge Pa. And so we're, um, uh, Amber and Kath have been putting together models that um, look at different scenarios um, for flows at um, Paritua Stream. So uh, let's see, this next um, point here is really just reflecting on how Mātauranga um, has uh, kind of is woven in and through the Te Whakaheke o Te Wai project from the project framing of the, the Māori name of the project through to identifying um, freshwater priorities working alongside tribes, uh, looking to collate and bring together uh, traditional Mātauranga Māori in relation to this particular place in, um, uh, in the groundwater systems there but also creating space for new understandings, new Mātauranga Māori, and exploring integration of that Mātauranga with Western science. 
so some of the, just thinking about the, um, the insights that Mātauranga is bringing to the project, Amber's done a really amazing survey of all sorts of um, different kinds of texts and sources, and they include oral traditions and observations that have continued to be kept by um, members of the iwi. Uh, place names that are both remembered and recorded tell us really a huge deal uh, uh, around uh, the character and nature of, of water in different places. Uh, there is literature uh, uh, from anthropologists and there is uh, a, a, a plethora of written narratives captured in crown material, government material, such as the maps, um, Waitangi tribunal evidence, uh, Māori land court records, uh, et cetera, et cetera, as well as satellite images. And so uh, Amber's done an amazing survey of, of the change in land use um, over time as well. And um, her mapping work really um, strongly resonates with the communities because they can see the changes, they can see themselves and, um, and their you know, grandparents are represented in the, in the territory um, in that way. So one of the questions that we grapple with in this project is how do we maintain the integrity of Mātauranga as a whole knowledge system when we're trying to uh, braid it, if, if you like, with the, uh, with the, the techniques of Western science? Um, how do we within, um, if, if for instance, you have a, a model, a modeling system that um, can only kind of handle a certain kind of information, uh, you know, uh, quantitative information, and can, that can only be fed in a certain way. Are we twisting Mātauranga far too much uh, in order to, to braid it to, uh, into a, a Western science system? So how do we maintain this, um, this epistemic equity in, uh, in uh, the nitty gritty of a project like this? Uh, as a relational system, Mātauranga Māori must remain connected to its holders, its iwi Māori, um, and not just be a data source for Western science, but, um, but at the same time, uh, if, if Mātauranga, as we think it may be able to, if it can constrain and give us a better prediction, uh, a more accurate prediction of what's happening in the underground, we would want to, we would want to try that. Um, the issues that we're dealing with are, are too big for one knowledge system alone. Um, so there are, there are challenges uh, that we're right in the thick of right now, uh, uh, but it's a very rewarding project and a very rewarding um, space to be in. And everybody involved in the project has been fantastic. And, um, and it just remains for me to say thank you for the opportunity. Kia ora. Thank you, Ocean. I love that last quote of yours that these issues are bigger um, than that, that we're dealing with are bigger than one knowledge system can hold. So I, that's a great quote that I will take forward with me. And, and thank you for the inspiration of how with the challenges and potential value of, of trying to do this braiding work that you're doing um, so valiantly um, down in uh, New Zealand with your, your, your team there. So thank you for bringing that as a as an exemplar of, of new emerging practices to our global community of groundwater scientists and practitioners that are hopefully taking this as inspiration and, and uh, learning from, from you and, and your group. Thank you, Tom, I really appreciate it. <laughs>